to Matt and Alex of the Long 70s podcast. And we are discussing, hi, uh, the the 70s malaise, the new left, and we'll probably talk about Christopher Lash too. But now I'm going to let Matt and Alex introduce themselves. So, Hey, I'm Matt. <laughs> and I'm Alex of the Long 70s podcast. That's right. So j- before we get into uh, the meat of the discussion, let's like uh, foreground your project um, because it's a very, it's both a very specific and a very broad show. Um, I've listened to your series on dystopian 70s sci-fi, um, but I've also listened to you talk about like audio file stuff from the 70s that I vaguely remember. <laughs> um, I, so I wanted to ask you guys what makes the long 70s the long 70s and how are you kind of denotating the period uh so i got the idea originally from a book by a guy named shulman who wrote a a book called um the 70s where he outlines the yeah yep bruce shulman Uh, this kind of concept of the long 70s it's a way of thinking about history more in like epochs or eras rather than 10 year decades because like the affinities for the events that happen inside and the trends, they don't necessarily line up to the decades. So it's easier mm-hmm. to think about it um, for Shulman originally from 68, I think to 82, mm-hmm. um, which I think I heard you mention on another show, 68 to 82. I, uh, I think we think about it more as 68 to around 84, 85. And that's delineated by, uh, Reagan's landslide re-election in 84 and then also right. the certain cultural changes like in 85 you get all the John Hughes movies there's this really heavy emphasis on uh, teenagers that you don't necessarily see in the 70s and late 60s in pop culture um, and aside from that it just became an interesting period where I guess the the general goal of the project is to figure out like what the hell is happening now? And you can really do that by looking at the long seventies because a lot of the things that happened then and the trends lead directly to where we are now. Um, And then the longer we've done uh, research on the long seventies, the more you start to think, well, well, what happened in the long seventies? Why did that happen? And you think, Oh, it's like the forties and the fifties. And it's just like this never ending recursion back into history. But um that, I mean, that's the basic project. Just everything and anything and everything long 70s, it all ties together. It's it's really cohesive. Right. And we sometimes come up with a, even a discrete topic or, or one thing, you know, sort of picked out of a, a headline, as it were, from that time period. And we'll just do an episode on that because it's the, the time period is just incredibly fertile for us and, and just some of the, the craziness and the stuff that's, if it's interesting to us, hopefully it's interesting to someone else. Well, it's interesting to me. I've listened to like two years worth of your episodes. So um, I am that rare creature of the bird between Gen X and millennial. Um, and so I was born in what you would consider the long seventies, but don't really remember it except when mm-hmm. I see pictures from like 84 when I'm like okay. five years old. And, right. Yeah. Um, and and it, it is striking to me, even in material cultural sense, going back and looking at like photos of my youth, how very different things look between 83 and 87. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, did you listen to the, the pop culture empire episode? Yes, I did. <laughs> that, um, that, that one struck me where the, the, the turning of, like the cultural, like the cultural revolutions every decade, new fashion, new music, just this constant need for new consumer goods of all mm-hmm. sorts, uh, just requires this overthrow of everything old and this kind of like new set of products, intellectual or physical or music, everything. And uh, a lot of people have noticed that that has kind of slowed down. Mm-hmm. since the long 70s and um there's i i noticed this thing on twitter where people post a a photo of of 2002 or something and say it looks it looks just like today whereas if it was 84 to like 
72, everybody would look completely different. But yeah. Uh, yeah. The eighties, the big eighties, as it were, feels like such a reaction to the seventies. I mean, even down to like the color palettes, I mean, it's kind of a cliche, but you go from like earth tones to neons just to be real broad about it. But it's, it, it just seems like such a turnaround that that's, it feels like the break in the long seventies. It really does feel like a break there. And, and it's, you know, it, music, everything. We, we constantly sort of find that, like, you know, we spill over a little bit into the eighties, but, uh, but the long seventies itself, I don't know. There's just a lot to, to get out of it. So we feel like if, if that's the only real sort of guardrails or bookends on what we work at, then I feel like we keep digging up more things. And that's why we don't put a whole lot of other restrictions on it. And we, we try to sort of sequence them in such a way and mix it up um, just so it's not uh, just so we can kind of find a different category of topic, not just the topic itself to explore with the, a given episode. I'm always surprised at what you find to talk about. Like I said, I was bizarrely fascinated by your audio file episode, which was not something that I thought I cared about at all. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> it was just like, oh, I remember turntables. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and in large speaker systems, <laughs> like, yeah. um, and public music. It's actually interesting to think about the, the shift in material culture. I was talking to a friend of mine about like why it seems like live music is dying and nobody's in bands and stuff like that. Um, and I was listening to the episode you guys did on fuzz pedals. Oh, yeah. And, and, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, it all like occurred to me that this like really was tied together in a very like the market has changed. Music has really not become it's not a social thing anymore and also mm -hmm. you know i'm a teacher it doesn't denocate social differences between like young people anymore either sure um, that's, yeah. that's a good point yeah um and so uh with everything available to people i mean now you could be one of those weirdos that gets in the music from the 30s if you really want to with spotify oh, sure um there is no real sense of either time period or subcultural delineation from music. And that's such a huge change from the, from the seventies. But another, the, I find listening to you show like a very fascinating study in contrast, because mm -hmm. there's other ways that after like two, I think about 2009, I feel like the culture has resembled 70s style, like malaise, the, the hope that, I mean, the obvious thing sure. is like, Silent Generation and Baby Boomers really do even demographically resemble uh, um, Gen X and Millennials, with the exception of Gen X and Millennials have been getting poorer and yeah. Silent Generation and, <laughs> and Boomers were getting richer. So right. um, and while that's somewhat stabilized, finally, it, 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 it is like sometimes it feels like the aughts and aught teens were the 70s in reverse. Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah uh, i guess that leads me though to a question what i'm fascinated about the 70s is like on one hand like when we think about the 60s we're often really thinking about 68 69 in the beginning of the 70s absolutely um, sure and then when we think about like the early early 80s we're also really like it's still the same culture for the most part as yes. like like you know term on reagan still basically the 70s right um pop but, culture too you yeah. know even, even even just some of the hallmarks of it you know uh, you see early 80s tv shows the clothes and the haircuts are the same yeah i, I think about i grew up like watching sanford and son and mm -hmm. just jefferson's and uh all in the family and there's continuity between the 70s and 80s on those shows definitely um absolutely um, not, yeah. not, not to be, uh, not to be like blatantly materialist about it, but I think a lot of people don't appreciate the fact that the, the time period between maybe like the, like, uh, fifties and when music streaming started was really, uh, an outlier in terms of as that there was no, people were not getting rich playing music i mean obviously they didn't have recording at some point but 
the sheer amount of just money that was thrown into making people famous, the marketing, uh, what the amount of money it took to press millions of records, that uh, streaming just killed that. And the on-demand, like you said, means that people can listen to anything. So it really breaks down that kind of marketing pop culture engine that can can target millions of people at once. And so you just start seeing uh, niche marketing and the, the, the industry cannot just throw money at making people famous. And that's why you see the Rolling Stones come out with a new album. They've been pl playing music or writing records for what 60 years now yeah. yeah and like the industry is not looking for new talent they got <laughs> they have like a stable of people that are big stars now it's just like the movie industry is starting to do there's not really any new movie stars they're just uh it's like nostalgia for stuff that happened 10 years ago so yeah. the the whole thing the whole industry and the, its ability to shape public opinion and consumer spending has just broken down. It's it's pretty crazy to watch. Mm. I think about, I was actually thinking about that too when I was thinking about music as a demarcator of pop culture, which is like something that's big in my lifetime, and everybody uses it as a frame of reference. But in like the grand cultural milieu of like even two hundred fifty years, that's weird. Like that's like a very that's like a three generation thing out of like twenty. You know, yeah, it, <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. No, yeah, um, none of your uh, Anglo Saxon scholars are sitting there being like, Well, we're really trying to get a handle on what they were listening to, you know, in that village in Sussex or wherever. Mm -hmm. That that doesn't seem tied into politics in a way, and yet somehow I also think it does because one of the things that I've thought about lately is we also can't get rid of politicians. And I think for like yeah. similar power law reasons, like the people who've invested in these politicians don't see the need in investing in new ones, that, even if they're like decrepit and 80 and, and like senile, it's just not relevant anymore. Yeah. Um, it's true. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that parallel is interesting to me. And one of the things I think about like cultural artifacts, uh, uh, like predictions of the future. If you look at stuff from the 80s and 90s, like dystopian sci-fi from the 80s and 90s, sometimes it feels further away in its themes than, mm. say, Rollerball does. Mm. Um, and that's fascinating to me that, like, uh, these movies that I grew up with and thought of as very old when I was, you know, in my teens in the 90s, um, somehow feel way more relevant to me now than they did in the 90s when it would have been in the nostalgia cycle like, yeah so i've been trying to think about why that is and i have kind of come up with like like kind of blatantly materialist reasons i i do sort of think like we are in an economic malaise that reminds me of the seventies in a lot of ways. Like sure. we don't have stagflation yet, but that's only because we don't have enough people to have high unemployment. There you go. Uh, they, they've I, also learned how to cook the, the CPI and the unemployment numbers <laughs> since, since the seventies, it's gotten very sophisticated and clever. <laughs> yeah. Learned not to make the same mistakes with the record keeping. Oh, yeah. I mean, the only reason even in the aughts that inflation was low is like we don't consider we don't put food and housing and education and medical care in the inflation. Index. Yeah, yeah. So, the uh, things people actually care about. Yeah. That's right. Minor details. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, well, actually, you, you, sorry, you had you were going to tell us why you thought that those the 70s seem more relevant to you well it, i think it's a lot of it does seem economic that, mm -hmm. that uh we're in a similar kind of economic malaise where like the prior period of figuring out how to do growth um has stalled out I and mean, it, it is really interesting when you look at like the like the difference between the early 60s and the late 60s is like you're going from an economic growth rate of like seven or eight percent which is not sustainable in a developed economy anyway but that's that, that was what was happening after the war mm -hmm. thank you for your plan um to an economic growth rate of like four to five and there being some unemployment <laughs> like uh yeah. which, which freaks everybody out and it does lead you know and then in the mid-70s you have the beginnings of deindustrialization 
Um, right. Yeah. So you mm-hmm. had a major economic shift. And I think we are, I personally think we're living through a similar economic shift that whatever we were doing in the eighties and nineties is no longer viable. Um, and I have no idea what's, I, I don't pretend to know what's coming in the future at all. Um, and I kind of do think, you know, the reason why I talk about like since 2008, it feels like the seventies in reverse is that was when like, we were reminded that business cycles were a thing, um, and that they were vicious. Um, so yeah. Um, Go go ahead, Matt. Oh, okay. Well, I was just going to throw this in. One thing that comes to mind, you know, it's funny. We we talk about, we have an episode on our uh, podcast about uh, financialization in the 70s. And one of the terms we talk about is sort of the, the giving way of like the manufacturing era to, you know, the information era or the information age or whatever you want to call it. But it's interesting if you talk about the information age or whatever, you know, as something monolithic, it really isn't though. I mean, we have sub eras and other things within that that no one even saw coming. I mean, you talk about how people, even in the 90s, were conceiving of what are computers, what is computerized things or data-driven things doing for us, just in a everything from pop culture to economics or whatever. They couldn't have foreseen how that how that manifests itself today. You know, with with like so-called Web 2.0 or or social media, all that. Like that's even a whole age within an age when you talk about the information age. Uh, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, it makes total sense. I was reading uh, this Euro communist book by uh, this guy named uh, Gortz. I think it's Andre Gortz, um, French Euro communist. And he was talking about in like 78, how automation had solved all the problems of manufacturing. And I'm like, you have no idea how far <laughs> this is going to go. No. You're yeah. already predicting that at 78. Like, like yeah. right. Yeah. Um, even AI, yeah. that's a labor-saving device, if you want to look at it that mm-hmm. way. You know, and, and now all of a sudden, it, you know, no sooner have, have people started quieting down about how cool it is that they just did something in chat GPT, and now people are like, well, wait a second, what if it takes away all these writing jobs or, you know, blah, 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 that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, no, th- the line between cool and scary is, you know, that's what technology is, and that's, right. you know. Well, there's a certain privileged strata of work, you know, as a person who's in that privileged strata of work, um, that chat GPT, if it gets good, really threatens. And mm-hmm. that, and I find it funny because, um, like, darkly funny, because I'm like, well, now, you know, the, now, like, this push for everyone to go into the intellectual fields is going to be very similar to the push for everyone to enter the industry in the 50s, because it, we're figuring out how to automate it. But it's very hard for me to see, like, well, where did all these people go after this? Because I don't know what they're. I don't see a, a low hanging fruit economy to push a bunch of people into. That's true. Um, well, they went. Yeah, they went into the service economy mostly. Uh, uh, although a lot of people just kind of went nowhere. You know, that's where you get the Rust Belt. Right. Um, right. And I mean, I, I was gonna piggyback on what Alex said about financialization. I think. Uh, I, th- I think people can like intuitively feel these kind of boom and bust cycles in, in the seventies you had the, basically the bust of the, like the massive production, the massive post-war production boom. Mm-hmm. And then uh, in the late nineties through two thousands, you know, I'm not sure when you would say it ended, uh, but you get the tech boom. So that that propelled growth and still does to a certain point although i don't think people necessarily appreciate um the financial wizardry that was pulled off after 2008 by by dropping like the fed rate to almost zero and just making money basically free uh to uh to like institutional lenders yep it and, made uh, investment not risky yeah yep and so you could just throw money at a hundred startups. If one makes money, you're good. The rest of them can just kind of sink and people will start new ones. And it's actually really smart to do this because you can live with that off the low cost of debt, the low cost of debt, like, like also means you're not paying taxes because technically a lot of your income's now turned into debt streams. 
<laughs> I mean, like when you realize yeah. this out. I also think there's financial trickery going on right now. I was looking oh, at yeah. like bank profitability and and like Fed stabilization and like it's tanked in the last couple months and the banks seem to be only only able to be viable because because if the feds are doing something else to get them a lot of liquidity um they're not doing qe this time it's actually a little bit weirder what is what they seem to be doing but it's uh it's basically borrowing at a loss at high like through paying out high dividends on interest rates so it's it's uh it all seems to be quite a mess um and again that reminds me of the way the way into and out of the 70s which which you know we I always point out to people that the, depending on how you measure profits and there's different ways to measure them. But in the seventies, we, we hit negative profitability, which is like unheard of. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And yeah. um, we basically fixed that by nuking the industrial economy and financial shenanigans, which led to a lot of asset inflation and, and whatnot, but it hasn't led to like general prosperity. I mean, you know, we remember the, I remember the late eighties. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, well, they they offshored a lot of industry and production to mm -hmm. countries that could do it for cheaper, and eventually, when you do that, those countries want to increase their own standard of living, and you get where we are now, where you can't just use uh, a country like China to like subsidize cheap prices in the United States for consumer goods. Absolutely. Um, and when we talk about like the end of inflation, to me, that's like, well, I mean, the return of inflation at the end of it. Um, the, to me, that's like culprit number one that we don't talk about. That like, oh, yeah, we're we are slightly decoupling from Chinese manufacturing. And also China is, is moving away from really low end manufacturing itself, although it's having problems itself with that, too. Um, yeah. I go ahead. I've got this theory. I don't know if you've probably heard it if you listen to the show um, that inflation never actually went away. We just ameliorated the, the, the price side of inflation by getting cheaper manufacturing someplace else and then gradually over time using less expensive, cheaper materials and everything. That's why like, a, like an Amish oak set of shelves costs like $1,400 now, but an Ikea shelf cost eighty dollars because it's built out of glue and sawdust <laughs> so and it was well, made in a you know a country with cheaper labor well it is interesting to me how much stuff that i can see for material culture you go into an antique shop and from the from the 40s to the 70s is still around mm -hmm. um, yeah, good yeah. luck on finding anything from the 80s or above that's still functional like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> e even if you use yeah thrift store shopping as like your your barometer or, or for something yeah i have memories of like people who say oh yeah you know like you know we went into the thrift store my mom went into the thrift store and we've got this dresser that we're still using today and you and you go and take a look at it and you're like my god there's like solid wood you know it was made in you know, like vermont or something like that or you just or it's like somebody painted it some ugly color with craft paint but you know so and so's got a youtube channel where they show how they got all that craft paint off and now they've got this amazing solid wood dresser and it's like yeah um my ikea dresser is not going to be in the thrift store because the person that's like moving it off the truck to try and get it into the thrift store is going to bang it against the doorway. And that's one less dresser you've got to put in the thrift store. So it, it's going to just using that little like sort of snapshot of consumer goods. That's absolutely going to, that, that's just a great opportunity to, to say, well, things are different. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I think I really like that point because something that I've noticed too, that when we do like inflation baskets, we're not comparing like to like in terms of good quality at all. Like, nope. It's nope. not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, and where there's labor involved, there's been, you know, any field that's labor intensive with the exception of agriculture for reasons that are unfortunate. Um, The prices has just have just shot up. Uh, are are or the profit margins decrease? Like when people ask me if they want to start a business and they tell me they want to start a restaurant, and I'm like, dear God, why? <laughs> like, right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 
like, do you have any idea, like, what your profit margin on a restaurant's going to be? It's actually remarkably low unless you get, like, trendy Michelin star stuff. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. So There's also the parallel manufacturing. Like, I feel like I'm hearing the word bespoke being thrown mm-hmm. around a lot more. So, right. Yeah. Well, but even, uh, yeah, the Doc Martin shoes. You can buy Doc Martin shoes today, and they have one line that's made in the UK and one line that I believe is made in China. So, I, I thought that was an interesting development that someone cooked up at Doc Martin HQ, but it makes perfect sense. You still get your shoes one way or the other. You just, you've got parallel lines there. Well, I think about, for example, when when there's this move to make like, like I think it's gone away now, but like American Apparel and stuff in the aughts and early aught teens, mm-hmm. where there's this move to make high quality versions of basic stuff in the United States, and it just became mm-hmm. very clear that a t-shirt was going to be fifty dollars. Like, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Nobody yeah. wanted the t-shirt that badly. Right. It's yeah. just like it's like okay, so if I make quality stuff here, at a at like a fair market rate out of decent materials, the same, basically the same stuff that we would have made in the seventies and sixties. It's going to call, it's going to call out how expensive the process is here. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, um, so yeah, I totally agree with you on that. And I, what I think is, is basically happening is the the rest of the world is kind of hit, you know, a lot of the, not like India or whatnot, but India doesn't have the industrial capacity, but like a lot of the rest of the world is, uh, got to the middle income <laughs> bracket and uh, they're not going to make stuff cheap for us anymore. So mm-hmm. um, yeah. Or, or we make it geopolitically difficult mm-hmm. for them to cooperate, which is just a giant mistake, of course, but the whole thing was really not sustainable anyway. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think that the, I ha- another reason why I think maybe we might talk about you know the long aughts or whatever, because mm-hmm. um, uh, I agree with you culturally. I was I have been surprised. I see I, I was I had a friend of mine who's younger than me was showing me their high school pictures from uh, from like two thousand and four, and I was just like, yeah, it really like high schools. Until, until unless you're talking about in the last post COVID have seemed stagnant for almost 20 years. And that's normally how I would like to know cultural change. Cause usually you see cultural sure. change first in young people. Right. So, um, but you know, I wanted to set this material background first to talk about like a kind of political background, because when we talk about like the late sixties, we think of, the new left, which gets associated with baby boomers. I think actually Mm -hmm. that's somewhat erroneous. It's actually mostly silent generation people who are reading that. But but, uh, it does happen in the late 60s and the 70s. Um, I I do think of the work of Rick Perlstein who points out that it was never as big of a part of the population as people seem to think it is. Um, But it does seem to be part of the 70s own mythology about itself. Sure. So, and yet, in some ways, also, I think of the seventies as like, for lack of a better term, a reactionary decade. So, how does that? And do you think I'm characterizing it fairly? <laughs> like, I think. Uh, um, I mean, I'll go first, and I'll let yeah, Alex talk. Yeah, sure. But um, it kind of depends on what you mean when you say the left. Mm-hmm. Um, because g- generally the way, and I'm not going to speak for Alex, but generally mm-hmm. the way I think about, uh, political delineations and the spectrum is the, obviously you have this kind of like Marx inspired left, which makes sense. Then you have like this kind of like, uh, traditionalist monarchist fascist, right. And then. I, I I think of liberalism as kind of a foundation that underruns the entire spectrum. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can have left liberals, right liberals. Um, and I think my personal opinion is that during the long seventies, it feels like reaction because 
there really is not a, like a left left in the long 70s. There's a liberal left and a lot of what you would call like the radical tendencies and movements were funneled into the liberal left uh, in the 60s. And so in the 70s, you're kind of wound up, you wind up with this um, very, like in the 70s, you don't see what would be called like class struggle or class-based analysis. It, it's really the the entire left takes on the language and like the the categories of the liberal left like you get um like liberation movements you get mm -hmm. um like anti-racist movements you get um all, all the you get like a democracy movements but what you don't really see is a lot of talk about like the working class or any real mass pol political movements. You definitely still have people who talk about it. And those people tend to get a lot of attention because they're very um, like their activity is very lurid mm -hmm. and, and hits a certain like nerve in the media. Well, a lot of them but, are terrorists. So well, like, yeah, 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 yeah. That that never hurts either. <laughs> but but like that is such a small portion of politics in the United States that it's almost non-existent on like a political level. Sure. Um, and I think that um, this is one of those things where, like I said, like how do I understand what ha what's happening now? I look back at the long seventies. What? But how to understand what's happened in the long seventies? I look back to the post-war period where um, there was a concerted government effort to funnel the left into what's called the non-communist left mm -hmm. um, started in Europe, but also involved the United States. And it was this, this like weird cultural war. It's basically like the book called the cultural cold war. It's, it's this back and forth between the, like uh, the U.S. And, and Britain and the Soviet Union, like who has the best culture. Um, and in doing so, it was also an attempt to marginalize the communist left mm -hmm. um, because obviously the Cold War was like, it was an anti-Soviet Union, anti-communist war. And so everybody just gets kind of shifted into like the non-communist left is essentially the liberal left. And um, you see people like, I guess I'm not like a that big into political theory, but I definitely have heard that Marcuse is like the father of the new left and his idea that culture is the new battleground mm -hmm. and liberation movements. Um I see those as, while I think he's actually right, because you can see the level that the government puts money into the culture war, which I think is much, much bigger than people can even imagine. But the the battleground during the Cold War was culture. And so he was probably right to think that. But at the same time, what it did was shift everybody into a liberal mode of thinking, which is like the you know like the glorious revolution the french revolution the american revolution you get like liberty democracy fraternity equality um that that that's the that's the the like liberalism owns that that's the battleground they they own that and they can they can turn and i say they there's no they it's a decentralized thing but they can turn any uh effort to to mount an attack on it right back into itself it's 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 pretty wild so i think that i think that's what happened that was kind of a long rambling answer <laughs> to yeah. say that i think politically the left doesn't have any power in the in the long 70s
Well, I think it's interesting, right? I think you're right. I just want to go ahead and like my reading of this as it, like I'm actually kind of a, the other thing I told you I was a historian of Lash. I'm also a historian of Marxism. Okay. Like, yeah, I, like, I figured that. <laughs> um, and uh, I can tell you that my reading is actually very similar, that what you have emerging is the cultural cold war, the Congress of cultural freedom. Ironically, right. the new left, the, the key figures of the new left, um, all have ties to the OSS. Of course. Uh, they do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if they don't have ties to the CIA, like Steinem, um, who's still around, I guess, but like they have ties to the OSS. Marcuse, uh, worked for the OSS when, the, I mean, they was when the Soviet union and the U S were technically allies, but like, sure. well, but, the, the, sorry ahead. to interrupt you, but the thing about that is, uh, in world war two, uh, it was a total war. The entire society was mobilized, mm -hmm. including the, like what you'd say the call the intelligentsia, but they didn't get sent to the front. They got jobs all together in information and academic type jobs, scientific jobs, research jobs. So they all, it's really hard to find an academic in this period, in the post-war period that didn't have something to do or wasn't connected in some way with intelligence or people in intelligence. That's why the Congress for Cultural Freedom works so well, because those people all knew each other from uh, Berlin and Germany and Paris immediately after the war. And um, so it, it's like a social networking group. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's weird to me when like you, you're, you're reading about like first generation college students going to Berkeley, like someone like uh, Terrence McKenna or something. Right. And like the CIA mm -hmm. is approaching them. And it's yeah. just like, wow, they were really all over these campuses. And I mean, w w I think we do have to remember that the 70s is when education explodes as a, as a segment of society. I mean, sure. Absolutely. Um, uh, in education studies, we talk about, um, which is my day job, um, like the 70s is when we hit universal basic education, um, yep. which, you know, I don't know that I totally believe, but it does. It is when we have established full access to it. And um, it's also when we stop seeing growth. Um, but it's interesting to think about that because when people compare like now to the past or like when people were talking about like scholars in the past and I'm like, yeah, but like only like 10% of the population had anything to do with the university. If that, even after the GI bill, you're only looking at 20%. Like it takes a while for it to become like de rigueur for the middle class. And this is something I also think we see shift in the seventies when I think about this and the new left and the cultural debates. Um, you could be a, a, a white collar worker, like a actuary, right? Like, or something like that. Uh, and support a family and have a, even an upper middle class ish life in the fifties with a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely possible. Um, by the seventies, that's already becoming impossible. And by the nineties, it is hard impossible. There's no way to do that anymore. So, yeah, it, that's mm -hmm. something that I think is is a is a major shift we start to see, and I think some of that's tied to deindustrialization. Well, I think most of it's tied to deindustrialization, but it's interesting to think about. I, I wanted to think about like though these like you know these key figures of of the the new left. You know, we hear about all the Maoist movements and and all that. And one of the things that I've been struggling, I read a lot of like. Uh, Marxist histories and, and criticisms of Marxism from, from the 70s. And I was reading Alvin Guldner, who was writing uh, in 79. And he was talking about this weird paradox of the 70s and on a global scale. Because on one hand, like the number of, revol you know, quote, communist revolutions had increased almost exponentially. Sure. And on the other hand, everyone was saying that there was a crisis in Marxism and everything was stagnating, which, which, was not just true. It was going to be true in a way that we started seeing real pushbacks on 
on uh, communist growth and like, quote, counter revolutions, unquote, worldwide, starting in the late 70s and then culminating in 1992. So that paradox is, is always part of what's driving my, my thinking about why everyone moved to culture, because it's like, on one hand, uh, there seems to be all these revolutions. On another hand, classical Marxism, even even before the even uh, twenty years before the fall of the Soviet Union, seems to be pretty much over. So, well, um, I, sometimes I think it has something to do with um, what, like from a class basis. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I do often find like class based analysis kind of useful, but uh, like. So, like the liberal revolutions were re uh, like a bourgeois revolution against monarchies and mm -hmm. traditional societies, essentially empires, and then, uh, like a Marxist revolution is what like a, like a proletariat against bourgeois. Mm -hmm. um, so, during during this time period, it's there's not as many places like all basically after world war ii the monarchies are gone um mm -hmm. and what are locations that are more suitable for a marxist style revolution um pe people try it in the u.s u.s is very difficult because it's so decentralized and um but you know in in uh african colonial countries they had a colonial government that was set up essentially like a monarchy. So it's, e it's a lot easier to know who is who you have to basically overthrow mm -hmm. to have a revolution. E even, um, uh, even, even China was more like that. Um, and although I personally, I think that in, in some of these cases, the, like the U S the cold war countries, on the U.S. side, use those communist revolutions to basically pry the European colonial fingers off of certain countries. I see Vietnam as that in a way. Um, mm -hmm. uh, everybody sees Vietnam as a giant loss, but if you look at it over a longer period of time, um, the U.S. and Britain were trying to get France out of Vietnam since World War II. And... Um, Essentially, that's what we did with Vietnam, even though, you know, it was a huge debacle, but uh, we kind of got what we wanted. And then same same kind of thing in Africa. Um, but I, I just think like suitability for that kind of class based revolution was not necessarily located in the West at the time, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think yeah. what you have in the developing world is you hit the realities of, I don't know, not having an industrial infrastructure and, and who's got it. Well, you can either appeal to the Soviets or you can appeal to the Americans and even China eventually appeals to the Americans. So it's, it's yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that's where we end up. And I mean, I, I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, 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 and I'm going to pivot to Lash soon, but I, I want to talk about one of my favorite 70s movies and one that seems, this is definitely a movie that seems way more prescient after, say, 2008 than it did when I was a kid, and that's Network. Like, oh, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like, Network has cultural predictions and stuff that you feel like got paused for 20 years and then came back, or, you know, or 30 years and then came back. It was very interesting to see. And one of the things it makes fun of is this new left tendency to like be radical and dramatic, but how in doing so, most of them become like a media spectacle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sometimes even like consciously, like right. in the case of like the yippies, like it was all street theater to, to get media attention. Right. I mean, yeah, I think about like you know the days of rage, and there's like what three thousand ter terrorist bombings in in uh, run by leftists in the '70s, and yet like the only people who die in them for the most part are the people who are, are the activists themselves. It's like yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the yeah, the, like the townhouse bombing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Start. Yep, it's uh, it's the spectacle that counts. Uh, right. Yeah. However, that is uh, like if you're going to go in like a situationist direction, mm -hmm. the spectacle 
only reinforces the establishment because the media picks up on the spectacle and the media benefits and the message they disseminate is crazy terrorists, uh, you know, bombing New York City, uh, you know, every other day for, for all of 1972. Yeah, absolutely. And what I find, what I find fascinating about that critique is it's, it's the beginning of, 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 uh, you know, something that's both becomes like transparently obvious in the nineties and yet also even critiquing it becomes co-opted by this, which is, you know, commodifying your descent and even like complaining about commodifying your descent is also yeah. commodifiable. <laughs> like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like I think um, about Mr. Show, which is like a commodity that was popular, that was also commenting on the commodification of descent. And it's just like, the meta there is crazy, but that kind of like network is where you is where you first start to see that. And it's not like the directors of network were like a vowed theoretical leftist or anything. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, well, I think that some of what network critiques is, uh, well, I, I see a lot of people talking about it now. It's actually mm -hmm. pretty interesting because if you, if you pay attention broadly across the political spectrum, now you see a lot of conservatives complaining about the media. The media is mm -hmm. not fair. It's propaganda. The media has the message in capitals. And, and they phrase it like this just started two years ago or five years ago. But this has been going on since TV was born, radio. The, the, the media has always basically been uh, an ally of the establishment, whoever's kind of in charge. Um, and um, so Network kind of pointed that out. But in, in a similar way that it happens now, it kind of acts like, hey, this is something that's just happening. Like, we need to stop this. And then people kind of go right back to just trusting the media, uh, you know, the nightly news. And so it is it is uh, this this weird, weird moment in time where the like the mask was kind of pulled off, so to speak. But you, once you see that, and you see like the last 10 years where people like once the mask gets pulled off, people just get used to the new face and just don't, they just don't care. So it's, uh, it's very sop soporific in a way. Well, yeah, I think about now, like I remember how we'd all, even in when I was a kid, we'd all believe if like, well, if if anyone proved that aliens were real, and I don't think we have proved it. I just want to point it out there. But it, like, <laughs> yeah. if, if, if anyone proved that aliens are real, like society would totally break down. And now I'm like, well, we're having congressional hearings, and literally no one gives a shit. Right. Like, yeah, it's it's, it's 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 kind of amazing. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, right. Um, the, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. The, the alien alien thing is funny because the parapolitical guys. Mm. have been talking about aliens for so long and then you finally and they, a lot of them have been talking about how aliens was like was a psyop mm. and then you get the you know like a cia essentially whistleblower come out and say yeah we got aliens you know we've had them for a while and then the parapolitical guys go just i told you so but still everybody else goes from there's no aliens to there's aliens, but we don't even care. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it, it just gets added to the pile of things that exist. Like the, the like the ontology just expands by just uh, aliens in CIA labs, but it, nobody, it, it doesn't actually change anybody's life <laughs> the way you would think it would. Yeah. It's it, it just, it, it's fascinating. And um, I know we think I, I think of the 50s as like the high period of like alien cults, but I also think of like uh, in the 70s, there's so much concern about what these, you know, could represent. I think like everything from the man who fell to earth to like how much stuff I was in the 70s. I, I was just thinking about that. Like that must have been a, like one of the genres. Um, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, Plus ancient ancient aliens became a, you know we had a an episode on uh the uh, books uh, by uh, was it eric 
fun Daniken, mm-hmm. like the chariots of the gods. So, I mean, you have that, that topic get introduced or at least popularized. Well, I, I think it's, I think it's interesting to think about this in, in long generational cycles, because I've always, my theory is that ancient alien stuff is actually a result of a uh, of post-war pulp fiction. <laughs> like, like, yeah, I like that. people mm-hmm. reading like Lovecraft and that's where it actually comes from. But yeah. you're right. Um, yeah. The old, the old ones. Right. Yeah. Um, that's I, I I think there's a scholar Jason Calvino who actually argues that too. But it 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 was it just occurred to me one day I was like, oh yeah, all this Pulp Fiction from the '40s sounds like the conspiracy theories from the '70s, like, um, which then become like de rigueur on cable TV in the '90s. You know, right? You definitely see that that uh, that trend. I, I, Matt, I was thinking about your discussion about like the cultural Cold War stuff. One of the things I was going to ask you is like, um, in so much there is such a thing called postmodernism, and I'm going to wear my former scholar hat and say like I'm not actually sure that's a thing, but in so much that it is a thing that we can vaguely refer to as you know philosophy and art as, um, that does seem to be like the ultimate like theoretical liquidation of of. Uh, like the old left into something way more liberal and skeptical and cynical. And it does seem to me pretty telling that it emerges in the end of the seventies. Yeah. I also don't believe in a Mm -hmm. postmodernism. I believe that uh, there's an attempt to transcend modernism but I don't, I don't really think it escaped. It, it reached escape velocity. It's, it, it just, it basically degrades into this kind of subjective individualism, uh, which is again, just this kind of like liberal perspective. Um, so even, even the art ceases to provide a transcendent message. It, is basically just whatever you see in it uh, as, you know, a subjective individual. It, it, generally, it reminds me of those, I don't know, you might be a little too young, but in the malls in the late 80s, there would be these uh, what these posters that looked like static, like a TV screen static. But if Magic you stared eye. at them, in a, yeah, if you stared yeah. at them in a certain way, which I could never do, I never saw a single thing in these you, there would be some kind of a 3d kind of image in them of a sailing ship or something or a dolphin. But, um, I, d- I definitely, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that postmodernism is even though it was funded by intelligence to a certain extent. Um, I think in general, it came up with some really good ideas, some really helpful ideas. But it it did not transcend modernism or like the engine of modernism, which just in my own way of looking at it is a one way is a one way ticket. But um, I, I mean, it, it, it's post modernism is also this weird thing where like the original people who thought it up were really were brilliant and they thought it up because they were really deeply educated on what came before. Mm -hmm. But then as postmodern studies kind of grow over the the decades, you get people who maybe never read the things that the originals did. So they're basing it just on the the previous postmodernists. So they, I, I feel, I just feel like they don't quite have the, the same impact uh, it, it, it just kind of it, it degrades a little bit over time, I think. Like, uh, yeah. I, as a person who uh, went to the mall in the '80s and also uh, uh, came up as a, you know, a first generation college, well, kind of a first generation college. My mother, my mother, and I, like, went to college roughly within three years of each other. Um, <laughs> uh, my experience of that was that I was in school when the quote postmodernists or the post-structuralists and, and metafictionists and all those guys were kind of 
ending their dominance. But by the time we were studying them, no, you're right. We weren't studying their context. Like the, maybe you got Nietzsche and a little bit of Heidegger and someone would mention right. Marx. And then you jump to like, we're going to spend, you know, an entire course on Foucault and Derrida. And that's it. Like, yeah. Which, which uh, does make them a lot less useful. Um, okay. So that brings me to like Christopher Lash, because I think it's interesting to me. I've always thought it was interesting. Lash is not a postmodernist at all, but he's actually responding to the same things. And he actually starts with some, with some similar assumptions. Like, um, uh, it's not in the books that you read for your episode on him because you pretty much focus on the culture of narcissism, uh, which, uh, you know, is his key 70s text, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, but in earlier books, like in the late 60s, he was actually applying Foucault to like American culture, but not in a postmodern way. He wasn't picking up Foucault's verbiage and all the weird French, like, uh, ways of speaking he was just talking he was just doing institutional analysis which he credited to Foucault um, okay. um he gets up on that by the 70s you know that long uh, a long uh, story short but what I find interesting about about him is most of his work both before the 70s and after although in a different way was very concerned with class analysis um and like looking at social class, the, his his two books from the long 70s, uh, well, there's three, but one of them I'm going to just bracket out. The, the first one's ha uh, Haven in a Heartless World, which is about the family. That gets him like a lot of conservatives start to listen to him, even though he hates that. <laughs> then he writes the Culture of Narcissism <laughs> to kind of explain that, which blows up because a lot of people treat it as like a Tom Wolf style book, like a general like you know, complaining about the culture. And it's absolutely not that, actually. But yeah, that was treated originally. And then, but what I find so fascinating is then and then in the Middle Mole Self, which was released in 1982, but was, I believe, written in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, he, he decides that, like, to understand politics in the 70s, you actually can't look at class alignments. You have to look at psychoanalytic styles. So... <laughs> um, uh, that that's an interesting thing. By 1987, he abandons it, and then unfortunately, he dies of cancer before we get a whole lot more from him. But um, I find it interesting that even he kind of thinks that, like, you can't explain, like, even the new left politics, which often talked in class terms, mm -hmm. what it actually did in class terms. Like, it was just not explicable at all in those terms and that you had to look at like relationships to psychoanalysis to figure it out. Yeah. Well, um, it, I, I think it's always important to not necessarily look at what people say, but to look at what they do mm -hmm. and the result. Um, and the result of a lot of class-based talk was not class-based outcomes. Right. Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. um, and, and this is a, this is another shift in the 70s that uh, so basically after the new left falls um, you get this this back to the state of nature thing going on broadly across culture like there, there's a specific back to nature movement where people you know move out to the country and they want to become farmers and they realize they don't know how to grow food because they're college students and they've never been outside of a city. But in general, you get this uh, fracturing of identity um, away from essentially the like the QK opera, like American Cold War identity to, you know, you get like, uh, I'm Italian, I'm Irish. Um, I mean, like the like the the black cultural movement predates this. Mm -hmm. But you see basically everybody get in on it. And um, that essentially fractures any kind of like class-based uh, activity because obviously not everybody is not going to agree if, if you're divided into like uh, not random, but like, 
uh, these kind of arbitrary like ethnic identity groups. And it just, it just becomes, it becomes difficult. Um, especially when you actually see that those kind of like fractured identity movements actually help people move into uh, a class like the intelligentsia or, you know, white collar work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you see Italians in the seventies talking about how, like you said, first generation college, you know, now, now I'm, I'm a college student. I'm not going to work on the docks like my, my father. And um, so it just gets kind of left by the wayside and it, it's the, the, the psychologizing that Lash does is difficult for me because in general, I try to stay away from psychologizing on a generation level, generational level. But I do find his the the insights he gets from it, I think, are valid. And he nail he, <clears throat> he nails like the new consciousness movements. He nails uh, the celebrity that like the celebrity seeking behavior. Um, which are things that really never went away and just kind of stagnated in culture. But, um, I mean, you, you could, you, you could maybe see like, it, like if you're going to assign uh, a personality disorder to different ages, you might see, uh, like the eighties is definitely keeps this kind of narcissism going. But then once the internet hits, it's like a free for all for personality disorders in society. <laughs> it's bor you, yeah. borderline antisocial um schizo yeah it you move from narcissism to this general cluster b like. exactly exactly yeah <laughs> it, it, so that also makes any kind of class-based action virtually impossible because everybody's in their own head and you're, you're not going to get like the working class bipolar people together with the working class narcissist and you're not going to make like a coalition of di personality disorders to overthrow you know like the the billionaires <laughs> it just it, do it doesn't work that way well i think that uh, you know i i have criticism of, of lash on this too i'm literally writing a paper right now trying to figure out why he picks that up so thoroughly but also why he abandons it and never says why because if you read his essays in after like 84 they barely go they barely ever touch on psychoanalysis again like this is really something he only seems to pick up from like 75 to like 82 and it's um and it's interesting and even his psychoanalysis um is kind of specific uh because like he he's one of the only people I know who tries to like tie that into modes of production. Like he really thinks that Fordism is why narcissism is developing, and he ties that to secondary narcissism. And then and then like, as Fordism in, in, ending, and like he doesn't talk about neoliberalism yet. He only I think he first writes about it in uh, the True and Only Heaven, one of his '80s books. Um, but. Uh, he he also seems to think that like we were moving into like quote primary narcissism and then you're right like by the time we get to the internet it's like i joke but i'm actually kind of serious if you follow him out it's like total psychic devastation all the personality disorders are are readily available now and their identities they are yeah, not just right. like things you have <laughs> like right exactly yeah there's a, a sense of fomo for that that, yeah. that i never noticed before yeah what like uh FOMO for, for personality disorders is weird. I mean, that is weird to me. And I know mm -hmm. that we're all going to sound like cranky old men now. And that's fine. <laughs> because in some ways, like, I'm a cranky middle-aged man, so I get it. But uh, you know, I was born in the card administration. It's it's time. But um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, nonetheless, um, it does seem to me that, like, that is a, a very particular cultural shift. 
that comes out of a couple different things. Some of some of them I don't even think are negative. Like I do think destigmatization of mental health is a great thing. Sure. Like, but I never thought that that would necessarily lead to mental health conditions as like identity categories on TikTok. Like that's yeah. That's not something I saw coming. Um, yeah. That's pendulum swinging, though. You know, you never know where the end of the pendulum is going to swing once you get, you know, once it gets started. That's true. And and I guess it, I guess it was one of the things that I was going to ask you is when you were reading Culture of Narcissism for your show and people should listen to the episode, I was telling the guys off air that that's how I found them. And also that, like, because they came in with very few preconceptions and, like, you know, you're not leftist academics. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, you guys aren't in uh, you guys actually had because you had less preconceptions you had a what I thought was like the most honest reading <laughs> because it's <laughs> like you're just dealing with the text um, so one of the things that I, I was going to ask you is when you read the culture of narcissism you know which I think does kind of a really describe a lot of the trends of the late sixties into the seventies and where it was seeming to be ending up and does seem to presage where we're going into like the eighties in a lot of ways, um, focus on youth culture, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, um, a kind of 50 style conservatism. Um, uh, a lot of that coming to the forefront. Uh, what did you find familiar when you read it and what did you find alien what was like not relevant to us today oh geez it's been a long time actually (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um, yeah, the familiar stuff is probably the obvious stuff but go ahead matt i it was all new to me uh this was very early on on the show true um and when i kind of flipped through the book before this i noticed a lot of different things different words and different ideas sprung out at me um i think that that his like his his idea of experts taking over working class roles or uh essential functions of the family uh struck a nerve with me that makes a lot of sense um his his concept of just the general character of the era makes a lot of sense now looking back at that no you know knowing the things that i know i feel more like it was the culture that was built i i I just at this point i feel like people drastically underrate or underestimate how cold war culture american culture was generated rather than was organic and i think that that has something to do with the character that it built like it was building this this kind of general narcissistic narcissistic kind of character which is essentially not not self-hating but maybe like uh the self is not the self is weak maybe maybe damaged and it's covered up by an outward expression of char- charisma or power or success that really that really hit a nerve for me then and now because i think that, that that's essentially the society that was built it was built on this public relations campaign of americanism and the Americanism was itself a Cold War weapon. It's it's literally what we still export to this day. You can watch it happen. The you, you know, an American diplomat will go to a country and they'll say, uh, they'll, they'll basically tell this country that they have to be more American. And so and and so that that aspect I feel is kind of vestigial because we've in some ways lost the power to, to enforce it. But um, after the cold war ended, which was 91, um, 
I feel like that the essentially it was still running on some momentum, but I think that that's why that kind of narcissistic societal character kind of, um, uh, you know, dissipated to some extent and you see a lot of different character in society after that. Goal reasons. Yeah. Does that I, make any sense? Oh, it makes a ton <laughs> of sense. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of processing like that, that, uh, there, that was such an active campaign and it's, I know when we talk about that, it sounds conspiratorial and I'm always like, well, often this stuff happens planned but not conspiratorially i don't know like when i think about like what happened in the 90s for example i don't think like bill clinton set up with a bunch of planners and said we're gonna do exactly this but i do think like a bunch of people saw a bunch of a bunch of things coming down the pipe and that was how they were going to handle it and and some of it was coordinated and some of it was just like the ideology of the day one of the things i'm thinking about though about when you talk about importing americanism i think people have a hard time dealing with that and in the U.S. military, because that's what the U.S. military does, uh, right. and so it makes it like the U.S. military is wildly culturally inconsistent. Because sometimes what we're importing is hyper conservative, and other times it has a rainbow flag. And um, that isn't to say anything about the content of those two kind of cultural orientations. It's just to say it's seen as part of what America is, and that's what we do to export, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so it can seem wildly inconsistent from period to period what we're, you know, trying to do as our cultural export. Um, we also don't seem very good at it, oddly. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and that's, that's always interested me. Like, like we are, we were good at it in the 50s, 60s and 70s because of like, not because of military power, but because of financial power. But yeah. Once we started asking the military to do that, it's like, you know, it's it's just it's kind of the wrong institution for the job. I mean, militaries kill people. That's what they do. Yeah. So, like, well, um, we uh, speaking of conspiracies, uh, mm. so QK Opera um, supposedly ended in 67. Mm. Um, and the the way these things go is they'll, they'll end and then they'll be renamed. So I don't actually think that the, uh, the effort to shape and guide culture changed, uh, or ended. It just, it just shifts into a different direction. And Alex and I have talked about this a lot and our, our next episode coming out. What is it? October 1st is going to be on, uh, the movies, red Dawn and Firefox, which are, just cold war movies you know they're they're like the quintessential rah rah america <laughs> right um yeah cold war movies you you can see the shift into that however um we're, 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 i lost the train of thought <laughs> um oh um so okay i lost it again <laughs> amateur yeah. It happens. Uh, I had a point. I had a point. Just fill, fill in the blank. Well, it it, uh, it it actually like comes to me now that I'm thinking about this. So I think about like the trajectory of both Rambo and Rocky, like yes. as far as like mm. understanding the situation. Like, like uh, Rambo is like a critique of U.S. military action, and somebody's even a critique of the police. And by the time you get to uh, what is it, Rock uh, Rambo three, like he's like single-headedly fighting with the with the mujahideen to defeat the soviets in, in yeah. afghanistan <laughs> like mm -hmm. yeah uh and then uh rocky is similar in that it's it's it doesn't have it the first two don't really have any geopolitical context at all it's you know kind of a a, a working class um uh, just kitchen seek sports drama right like mm -hmm. and then by the time you get to Rocky three, it's like we're going to defeat the Soviets with diplomacy through Rocky boxing. four. Rocky four, yeah. Rocky, yes. Thank you for correcting my Rocky numbers. But yeah, it's that you know that's how ridiculous it gets. But also, mm -hmm. it does seem to like clearly mirror a shift from even now. I mean, the only other movie period that I think has as much cultural ambiguity in everything as the seventies is like two years in the nineties. It's like 98, 99. 
but yeah, like yeah. like um like you even watch a horror movie I don't know, like, because uh, William Freakin died. I've watched The Exorcist recently, so it's in my mind. Um, and the amount of cultural ambiguity, even in a ostensibly beginning of Satanic Panic movie, um, mm -hmm. is is uh, way more pronounced than, than than what you'd see in the '80s, or even you know, in remakes of The Exorcist now, including the ones that are coming up. Um, so uh, do we make anything of that? I mean, how does that, like, why was, what do you think was part of the culture where the ambiguity of American culture was much more just front and center in the seventies than it is later on? Um, I, I think it was advantageous. Oh, I, I, this is, goes back to the point that I forgot. My point was, um, that actually American culture, cultural export was incredibly successful, but maybe, maybe not now, but during the long seventies, um, you know, people will say blue jeans won the cold war. Uh, I think that like rock music and seventies uh, movies basically won the cold war. It essentially proved that American culture was superior and everybody could see it on a movie screen. They could see, they could hear it in the music. Even though there's some actually really awesome Soviet music from the from the late '70s and early '80s, but we didn't hear it, of course. Yeah. But um, but I think that that stuff was just so good that it solidified our cultural dominance around the world for decades. And part, part of why people feel like cultural creation has just ground to a halt is because we are running off that time period this whole time um, and s still are in some ways. I mean, like Hollywood is just rebooting. Like you mentioned The Exorcist. They're just going to like re redo it and try to try to make lightning strike twice. But it it's not going to work because it's not really authentic. So, and the timing was perfect. You know, it, you can't duplicate the, a, a point in time always. I mean, we, we start the long seventies with the end of the Hayes code, for example. So you get like this loosening of restrictions, you get like director driven films and you just get an explosion in like the variety and just sheer volume of them. So these are like, uh, you know, artistic creations, but they end up being cultural exports in the process. They're there to be exported if somebody wants them to be, but you know, you, you can't shift if, if those things had happened at a different time period, it wouldn't have the same impact. You know, you've, you've got this ramping up of things once the restrictions come down and just the sort of the vibe in the air is there. That's why you get the films that you do and you get just a huge variety of them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, and uh, you you mentioned why it is like cultural criticism so successful, um, because you know, as deconstruction proves, deconstruction is an incredibly powerful process, and criticism is imp incredibly powerful. It releases a lot of energy out of whatever institutions and traditions you're critiquing. You know, if you can if you can tear apart a genre uh, and deconstruct it, at least initially, that is, you get something really interesting with a lot of energy. But that... You actually say it's a genre a lot of the times, interestingly. But Oh, deconstruction? But, yeah, like like the reason, like deconstructed Westerns are the only reason Westerns were viable after the yeah. 60s. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting because the whole... Western genre was basically a fantasy in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that one had to be deconstructed basically. Um, I, I'm with you about that. I, I think it's interesting because I think of, you know, um, I, I, I've watched a lot of Soviet movies and the U S ability to critique itself, particularly in the seventies actually ironically ends up making it look stronger. Right. Because, you know, it can it can deal with the self-criticism, whereas like 
even oblique criticism and someone like Tarkovsky ends up with, you know, the best Soviet filmmaker having to like, and, and even though he was a weird religious mystic, he was a loyal Soviet <laughs> citizen, like, which I've actually never even really understood. Um, <laughs> uh, with, with like him having to go and escape to Italy to make movies, like, and, and not being able to make that many after that point because of, because of cancer, but like, um, that, that you don't have, you no, know, you don't have like this art house cinema, like cons, you don't have like French new wave, but what you do have is, a, is the United States being able to glom on to that mm -hmm. and make it palatable to a world audience to the point that like, it's no longer clear how much we were pulling from that stuff now. Like it, it's the, like the seventies, like, like, like a seventies American cinema, like the Godfather being reliant on like French new wave cinema is both like, if you study film, you know it, but that, that kind of, those kind of seventies blockbusters are so dominant that like you actually don't catch it when you watch them anymore because they seem too generous. Right. Like, right. Um, so, you know, that's interesting to me. And I remember, <laughs> I remember in 2007, I, everyone was telling me that like, Oh, it's going to be like the seventies and we're going to get mo good movies again. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I, uh, <laughs> just to remind you what film was like in the thirties. Um, it seems a lot more like that right now, actually, than it does seventies. Where we're yeah, just, it does. Like, mm -hmm. You know, mass produced, unmemorable serial slock. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, um, I mean, uh, American liberalism and liberalism in general has always thrived on reinvention and revolution. I mean, it's a revolutionary ideology from start to finish. Uh, so the the constant revolution in techniques and and um, like themes and the deconstruction that all plays right into you know the like the the, the capitalist strong points. You, you just you can make just as much as much money deconstructing something as you can constructing something and um so they can import you know, those new wave techniques and just a, apply them to an american like theme and it will make just as much money as if they had created new wave in the start maybe even more so to, to kind of pivot towards wrapping this up, see, I know you guys uh, uh, have lives. So um, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I was thinking about asking you is, and, you know, you guys have been doing the show for a while now and, mm -hmm. and you cover so many different areas of, of life. I mentioned the pop culture empire episode. I've mentioned the audio file episode. I've mentioned like music equipment episodes. There's all these movie episodes um one thing i would ask you though like uh and since you know this is kind of on the theme of of culture and you know the liberal left versus kind of a marxist left or whatever but maybe we can just broaden it out to the entire thing uh what about learning about the 70s has really surprised you like what did you really not expect about the entire decade as you studied it Wow, I'll have to give that a thought. Hmm. Um, I think actually the reality versus the like the mythology of the time mm -hmm. period. Um, I mean, you you started off the show by mentioning that what when people think of the '60s, they're actually thinking of basically the beginning of the long '70s and the seventies proper, um, just the, the fact that there is actually so much, so much going on that has nothing to do with hippies or rock and roll or earth tones. Right. It, it, it's such a complex time that is only kind of remembered through these like these aesthetics that yeah you can pick and choose and hind when you're in hind when you're looking at it in hindsight you can pick and choose 
you're not, you, you don't have to take the whole picture. Um, yeah. 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 Just, just to piggyback on what Matt was saying in a nutshell. Also for me, one thing uh, that I got out of it is that this it's for the purposes of our podcast, the seventies is both a, an entirely like self-contained era from which to draw content. But I also find myself thinking a lot about it as like a period of transition to mm -hmm. connect more modern times with like just the post war years or even just, just other parts of the 20th century. Like it, it can be a bridge sometimes, and it can also just be something unto itself that you don't have to leave. Yeah. That, that, that's actually probably the best point is, and what every single episode sticks out to me is the fact that there is like, there is a transition point so, somewhere in the seventies for almost everything. Movies, mm -hmm. music, politics, culture, so society, family, economics. It, it's its in there uh, if you just look. And, and it's not even, it's not even like, a, like if you're a film critic, you can, um, like, you can almost read anything into a movie. No, there, there's literally a, a set of events or, ideas that that change somewhere between 1968 and 1984 that lead directly to a new trajectory it, it is pretty wild yeah and at the same time you can see things that you cannot imagine happening at any other time in history either mm. yeah that is yeah i think about that i mean it's 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 interesting, like, you know, for me as a person who was born in the last year of the Carter administration, as we already said, um, the 70s feels both like like my immediate context, and yet also, until very recently, it also felt like a bajillion years away. And yeah, sure. Like, but but it, it, I think it felt a bajillion years away because it was like the hinge point. It's like, okay, well, this is the first time of this kind of movie, and this is the first time of the of this type of thing and this is when like youth culture really begins and like, right. even though it's not the primary focus it's really you know this is when we see like the shift from like new hollywood cinema into blockbuster cinema this is when like uh this is when religion gets weird even <laughs> like yeah um yeah. <laughs> like and so by the time i'm coming around in, in you know the mid to late 80s it's the air i breathe yeah. Mm -hmm. Um and it feels so familiar but it also feels like it's always been that way. Right. Yeah. And I have to constantly remind myself that no like the post-war world was actually very different than the post-70s world. Like Yeah. Uh, and and also the pre-war world is like undeniably different from the post-war world cuz you're barely talking about automobiles. I mean, like the amount of change when people tell me today that oh my gosh there's so much change happening right now and i'm like have do you do you know anything about the last century <laughs> like yeah yeah like do yeah. You, let's talk about 1910 versus 1960 like yeah, um, right. well th this is something i think about all the time um and also something that i kind of learned from the podcast is um are you are you familiar with mark fisher's formulation of hauntology Oh yeah, um, I didn't tell you this, but uh, like my my claim to fame on the left is I'm the person. I'm one of the two people at a magazine that published the Vampire Castle, so I knew Mark. So, oh, yeah. so. very. That's actually that's actually one of the coolest things I've ever heard. I I love him. <laughs> I love the Vampire's Castle, but um, I think he nailed hauntology, and I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure, even sure why he was right, but the this the the seventies and mid eighties, the long seventies, seems like the last real time, and and our culture is just haunted by it, the ha haunted by what the possibilities brought up in that time period could have been, mm -hmm. all the amazing ideas, like you said, the science fiction, mm -hmm. um, the just the futurism of the time mm 
even politically, just the kind of positive, we're going to, we're going to change the world. We're going to change this. We're going to change that. It really just faded away. And we're just left with this, this massive monolith of culture that just haunts us to this day. And it's why we remake the movies. It's why there's never really been nineties nostalgia. You know, they, they tried, they, they, did it with fashion a little bit. They try to remake the movies a little bit. They try to bring Jinko's back. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but you're right. Actually, I have thought about that. Like, it, like, it seems like we go through the cycle of seventies through eighties nostalgia. I feel like I've lived through it like three times, actually. You, you have. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, um, and they keep trying to push into the nineties and we never get there. And like the idea of aughts nostalgia just seems like impossible. Like that'll never happen. It's just like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's funny we, because I, I go ahead, Alex. Oh no, go ahead, Matt. I was going to say at one point, a couple of years ago, I tried to pitch Alex on a, an idea for a new show called uh, null exit. Uh, oh, right. Which was about how the nineties were the last decade uh, or like the early part of the nineties. Um, really and i i actually listened to your show i think with elijah about Mm -hmm. um fukuyama and the end of history it's not really the end of history i'm talking about but um it's it just ended you know like the the new ideas like if you act if if you ask somebody who's 22 now to describe the future they uh the ones i've talked to just cannot no, there's they almost, don't. There's almost no way to think of anything new because like that the time frame has been constricted to basically now and the things from the past that are like imported and repackaged. It's uh it's bizarre, <laughs> you know. It it is weird. I was watching uh and this is something that I have noticed that like um even in like educational milieus like people are increasingly presentist on everything like oh the you know stuff might be problematic or whatever before 2008 and there's a whole controversy about one one library in a in canada apparently using their uh their their criterion for inclusion to get rid of seemingly everything before 2007 and it's just like and yet um it isn't like anything feels future oriented. The one thing I can say, like, I, I, you know, I'm a high school teacher um, by trade. uh, And um, kids now, uh, they're, they're really conscientious and sweet in a lot of ways. And they're very plugged into current events in a way that I know I was not in, in my teens. Sure. However, um, Mm -hmm they don't really believe in a future Mm. like at all. Like, like they have no concept of like in a way that like really concerns me now because I'm like, okay, how do I walk them through like life choices so that they have their own future? And they're barely concerned about that. And it's just like, whoa, like, you know, and I know there's very unique conditions for them. um, But, you know, given COVID and everything else, but it's, it's still, it's sort of shocking when I think about how non-future oriented they were. And I remember sitting in a classroom in 1988 uh, in a work, you know, in relatively working class suburbs, as, as suburbs in Georgia. And, you know, being talked to about the possibility of a future without war. Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. like, and, and third grade. And like no one would even begin to pause. That would just seem ludicrous to pause it to people sure. now. Sure. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. No, I remember. Uh, I I actually was reading a, a book by Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Childhood's End, and I remember at some point I had to put the book down because it it posits this future society that doesn't have religion in it. Which, as a futurist, when he wrote it you can totally see coming, but now I fast forward to now. And I was like, well, hold on a second. Even just as an American, I mean, religion is as much part of the conversation as ever. So it was, it was like, um, 
what do you call it? It was a, it was a willing suspension of disbelief that I just couldn't will enough. I couldn't, I couldn't disbelieve it enough to make the book, you know, to get back, to get my head back into the book. Yeah, I find that interesting, actually, Alex. You know, when you talk about secularization, uh, the U.S. has finally like caught up to Europe on secularization, and yet you're absolutely right. That doesn't make religion go away at all. No, like, mm-hmm. like not at all. Even if the religious institutions aren't particularly viable right now, they seem sure. to still be super relevant. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's just woven into different things, or it's coming from a different place. Yeah, I mean, the idea that like if we became secular, we were all going to be good, good scientific humanists. Like that mm-hmm. to me is like a laughable thing that people as recently as 2009 believed. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, astrology's back. Like you're on. Yeah. 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 That's true. I, I, I it's like over re, you know, uh, seeing a, uh, like a Reddit post where someone's complaining that their girlfriend just dumped them because, uh, cancer and Sagittarius don't work out or something like that. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's what somebody's talking about right now. Yeah. It's true though. Yeah. It, um, it, it's funny. I mean, it's, it's kind of hilarious uh, because I, again, that's something I associate with the seventies. So, yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, Matt. Uh, I mean, the thing about religion is that it does in a way give you a vision of the future. Mm-hmm. Um, even if it's, I think, you know what, um, it was Lash who was talking in culture of narcissism, talking about how people were, uh, divorced from the idea of, uh, a, like progeny, like their society in the future, like a legacy. Mm-hmm. And I think that religion does impart that in a certain way. It also, depending on religion, will give you an actual future. Like this is when the, you know, millennialism was huge in the the seventies and in some ways still is this idea that the world's going to come to an end. It, it kind of will tell you what the future is about. Um, but I don't think that there's been any, the, the, you're right. The, the weird thing is that the secular version has not kept up. It, it just disappeared M- maybe because we had the the tech boom, the technological revolution, and all we got right. are a bunch of apps that help us order McDonald's. No, you're uh, right. Yeah. The, the the exponential rate of of change for tech stuff, I think for me at least, just just my read plays a huge part of that. It's like it's it's hard for me to keep up with what's next, you know, to to see that future because the future already came faster in some ways. I mean, we never got the jetpacks that I was hoping for, but like the future came faster and in different ways than I even would have guessed at. So if I couldn't guess at what's happening now, how can I guess at what's happening in the future? Yeah. It's interesting reading like seventies and eighties, for example, like cyberpunk or proto cyberpunk Mm -hmm. and like what they get right, but also what they completely don't see. Yeah. Right. Um, (laughs) And like almost nobody sees this. Right. Yes. Who are listening. That's right. Yeah, the smartphone. Except for Star Trek. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I drag uh, out my old. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. But I can drag out my old thing that I always feel like I come back to periodically on the podcast of how uh, someone like Philip K. Dick was imagining these advanced androids, but they've still got a roll of tape of magnetic tape in their back that that makes them able to speak. (laughs) You know, somehow the, the microchip or the integrated circuit didn't make it into his his concept of the android. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that. I mean, you know, I guess that's that's the, the whole thing about studying the history of futures, right? Like, you can go back and watch those cartoons that I used to watch in the 80s that were, like, from the 50s and 60s about what the 90s were going to be like. And they are, oh, my God, wrong. But um, uh, it is interesting now, living through the time period that it's supposed to be the culmination of of what uh the 70s and 80s are so you see like when a lot of these like you know far future well near far future stuff ends it's like 2010 to 2020 comes mm-hmm. up over and over and over again and in some ways technologies have progressed way faster and in, in other ways like if you think about technology as actually changing your life in major major ways mm-hmm. um that might be true with this LLM AI stuff but right. so far 
the life changes significantly less. Like if you compare like the technological d- the difference between 1890 and 1940 mm-hmm. versus 1980 to now, it does seem like, well, things are both sped up and slowed down simultaneously. Sure. And that's, yeah. that's a, that's a, I think that would just be, it's just disorienting. Cause you're like, well, so much is coming at us. And yet also our life is more similar you know, to what it was in the late nineties than someone's life was in the seventies was to the forties. It's, it's really, it's really complicated to think about. Um, So I think that's a good enough point as any to end. I could talk to you guys all day. Uh, Can you, uh, yeah. Can you plug your social show and anything else you want to plug? Um, So the Twitter account is long seventies. Um, I, I run that. Alex doesn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> so if you're going to get upset, get upset at me <laughs> at my shit posting. Um, I find your shit posting funny. <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, we have our website for those who like to do that. That's right. <laughs> the long 70s podcast.com. Uh, yeah. And if you want to send us an email, it's uh, a nice one. We, we take suggestions for podcast episodes. We do have a pretty long list at this point. Some people have been giving us some pretty good ideas, but um, we'll get to them. Uh, you can send that to the long 70s podcast at gmail.com. And so far, I found you guys on almost every podcaster available. I've looked, yeah. So, you know, you guys are readily available. So just look up the long 70s podcast. If you like this show, it's a very different show, guys, you know, but uh, but um, I find it so fascinating because it's both very limited and utterly not. So it's <laughs> it's just that like, describes us too. That's, yeah. that's the secret to the success. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it's like okay, well, we're only dealing with like basically fifteen years, well, sixteen years, but uh, but anything about those sixteen years can come up. So. Yeah, yeah. I um, yeah, we, yeah, we had a whole I really episode like... on the sex raft, for example. <laughs> yes, that's I, right. I forgot yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I enjoy your show too. I, I, I listen to it when I make dinner. Oh, I, I listened to the Fukuyama uh, episode while I made a salad. It was, it was pretty intense. So uh, yeah. That's, um, that's, I gotcha. Yeah. I am a general, I'm a general interest, non-sectarian vaguely leftist podcast, but it's like, I also like you guys decided that uh, I wanted to talk about whatever. And I didn't want to be, I don't know if you guys know this, but the, there's like a, there's like a, not far left. Well, there, there is a far left one now too, and it's kind of obnoxious. But there's definitely like a center left podcast pipeline, hmm. and I decided a long time ago that like, I only occasionally want to dip into that when I find someone who's doing the rounds when their book came out interesting. But yeah. in general, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. Yeah, and. Yeah. and it's worked for me. So yeah, that's, um, that's how we're doing it too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I totally, I, I really enjoy your show. And like I said, um, you guys often go in with uh, a very, uh, a very uh, fresh and clean mind. I also like, uh, I, I gathered that you guys are, are left ish, but not left dish. I mean, left ist Exactly. Um, by that I didn't you didn't sound like sectarian leftist at all. Um no. No, I yeah. think we try to be I think we try to be fairly neutral with our presentation. Yeah, I don't even know how to describe myself. <laughs> yeah, we 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 try to let the the topics, you know, kind of try to give the topics their space and and all that and you never know by the time we're we're working through an episode, we may start on one thing and end up on another. So Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 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 Matt, it's funny that it's you. Okay, now I know who was talking to um, on Twitter. Um, but hey. <laughs> uh, yeah. I actually, you, one of the reasons I love your shit posting is you're one of the few people who I can't predict what you're gonna say. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, like most people I know, I'm like, oh, I know what their take's gonna be. Like, I'm like that '70s podcast. I don't know what they're going to say about something. So, so I'm, I uh, mostly comment when something irritates me. Right. Uh, somebody's view of history is not long enough. Like they don't realize that this exact thing, same thing happened before. It's probably irritating to a lot of people, but sometimes I just feel the need to get 
that out there. And also current politics irritates me to no end. And uh, my, the drafts folder is full of posts where I just said, no, I'm not going (laughs) to say that because there's no, no need to argue online about politics. Yeah. You have to stop and count to 10 and then decide if you still want to send it. I learned that unfortunately in my forties. So (laughs) sadly there's back in Facebook days, there's lots of useless and long debates. Um, So, uh, and Twitter uh, makes that worse because you can get ratioed. Um, And having been ratioed, although I got ratioed for something stupid. Um, (laughs) Like I got ratioed for, for comparing left-wing JFK conspiracy theories structurally to Bertrand conspiracy theories, and people got real mad. So really? I like, yeah. And I, I'm like, that. It, it, I didn't even think it, I, that was going to get any likes or hate at all. It was just like, you know, I'm just like, oh, okay, whatever. Like, in some ways, this JFK was a secret anti-imperialist reminds me of JFK as a secret anti-globalist Bertrand yeah. conspiracies. And that's all I kind of said. And uh, apparently I said it on the wrong day. Hmm. so well, tw- twitter is like a weird rage machine you just you just never know you know yeah it it, it, it uh incentivizes people just to get mad about nothing i i really miss the old forum days i learned a lot on the internet in the first uh probably 10 15 years i, was well, I made lifelong friends on the internet before twitter like I actually can think of, I mean, some of us being young, but I, I think about it and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like met people's families who I met on live journal and yeah. even on early Facebook. But after like 2013, that doesn't happen anymore. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on. Thank you for giving me about two hours of your time and people should check out their show. I, I love it. So. Uh, You're welcome. Thanks for yeah, having well, us thanks, on. Uh, thanks for having us on. It's been great.